It is not playing nice on the go live. Yeah, it doesn't, I don't have that we're live. It just says that we're recording. Well, that's not ideal. I'm waiting to accept the recording. All right, hang on. Do you want to give me control so I can push? Yeah, okay. Go ahead. When I push this out, um, Beth, can you just uh, revise the yeah. copy? Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Kim Alexander coming to you from Houston, Texas. And I am so excited for today's conversation. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Kim Alexander coming to you from for today's conversation. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Kim Alexander coming to you from for today's conversation. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Kim Alexander coming to you from today's conversation. Okay, I think we might have that resolved. I was hearing myself in stereo. These are <laughs> you know, sometimes things happen. Um, but I am excited to be here with you guys. It is our monthly webinar call, and this is our talk on World Mental Health Day. And I am just so excited to have these gentlemen here with me for our Reclaiming My Mind After Doing Time Life After Incarceration conversation. And I am joined by Dustin Greaves from Rise Up Industries. Hi, Dustin. Hello. I have Andre Drayton here from, uh, tell us the name of your organization. Outside Plug LLC. Good morning, everyone. All right. And then I have Kawan here and Joseph, who are participants with uh, Rise Up Industries. And I'm actually going to give an opportunity for each of them to tell us what it is that they do, the organizations that they are associated with, and why they are on the call today. And I'm going to shoot to Joseph and let him start. Um, good morning, uh, first of all. Um, my name is Joseph Raglan. And I am a, a graduate of Rise Up Industries. Um, and Rise Up uh, Industries is a nonprofit organization. Um, and uh, it specializes in um, providing uh, training. Uh, and it's an apprenticeship program for formerly incarcerated. Um, and so we come out and not only are we taught a skill set, um, it's a machining apprenticeship, so we're taught how to uh, properly machine um, to operate CNC machines, um, uh, but we are also giving uh, a lot of uh, different um, uh, opportunities to, to help ourselves um, holistically, so we have uh, programs like um, Catholic recovery, where it's basically AANA, we're able to deal with uh, addiction. Um, we're also able to come together for a, a, a member led um, uh, relapse prevention program. Uh, we, we have uh, other programs that we do like book clubs, uh, case management, um, we have uh, it, basically an, an at will uh, psychiatrist uh, and therapist um, that's basically on call that can come and meet with us at any time that we need them to. Um, and so I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a graduate now. Uh, I've, I graduated uh, about three weeks ago and, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm still a member uh, of Rise Up um, and just thankful to be a part of an organization and a program like that. I spent eight years in prison um, out here in California. I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee, 
mm -hmm. uh, born and raised, uh, and, you know, lived in, in Texas for three years um, and, you know, spent a year in school in, in Missouri. Um, and so been out here in California for a while. Most of that time was was in prison. Uh, but I'm thankful to have uh, come across uh, the opportunities that I did. Um, even while incarcerated, I was able to meet some people, uh, some individuals who were driven, um, who helped impact my life. Um, and so I'm here today trying to give back, trying to be a part of that growth and that rebuilding. Um, so I am uh, pleased to be here with you all this morning. Okay. And Kawan, tell us how you got involved in Rise Up Industries and a little bit about your story. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Kawan Williams, and um, I've been part of Rise Up Industry for um, going on um, about 15 months. I have two months left until I graduate. Okay. Um, I heard about the program through a former Selly that, uh, 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 that I was incarcerated with. And he had a, a friend whose brother was in the program, but he ended up leaving the, leaving the program for whatever reason. So that's how I heard about the program. Then I started uh, reaching out to uh, Joseph Gilbreth, the founder of the program, and me and him started corresponding. Uh, at that time, I was going through the courts, uh, trying to get a sentence modification to get my sentence reduced. So uh, I ended up getting my sentence reduced and I just continued to reach out to Joseph and uh, uh, Joseph Gilbreth. So uh, upon release, he interviewed me. Um, I pretty much got accepted into the program. I had to complete another 90 day program before I can even join Rise Up because I was incarcerated for so long. Um, I was incarcerated, well, for, incarcerated for. I was incarcerated for 14 years from a, a 26 year sentence uh, due to good behavior. I was able to get out of prison a lot uh, sooner. My original release date was 2033. So I'm extremely grateful that, that I'm here because I'm not supposed to be here. Um, I set full responsibility for the crime that I committed and, and, and I know that I deserve to be punished, but you know, I'm just extremely grateful to be here and, and had that opportunity and many more opportunities are just open up uh, through the Rise Up industry. One of the things that uh, wasn't mentioned was the mentoring program that uh, Rise Up has at Monarch. Um, so that gave me the opportunity to go uh, volunteer and uh, uh, share my life experiences with troubled youth or at-risk youth uh, uh, um, it tried to deter them from not making the same decisions and, and bad choices that I made. Uh, so um, I think Joseph covered mostly everything. <laughs> for <us right laughs> <up. laughs> I want to shift over to Andre and, and the outside plug. Andre, first of all, tell us how you got there. Tell us how you birthed it and tell us the why. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I was incarcerated for 15 years. Um, I was in the state of Virginia, and before I even got out, I felt like there weren't enough, you know, resources for me. I didn't really know what to do. I missed a lot, obviously. So the thought of outside plug just entered my mind. And then when I came out, obviously it was a reality check. I had to teach myself a lot of things learn about entrepreneurship and outside plug just kept evolving. Um, I'm the CEO, I'm the founder, I'm everything. And um, I had a good support group and it's just something that I had a passion for to, you know, give, you know, other, you know, I call them IFs, which means inside felons. I wanted them to have an opportunity to do the right thing and have a blueprint, so to speak, and an example of what to do because it's a lot you don't know you think you know but you don't just a small thing so now you know thankfully i'm able to evolve into helping with clemency packages okay. pardon packages um i'm also you know kind of like i don't want to say take by the hand but just help you know people coming out with the simple things because you know you don't know how to even get identification Mm. or create a resume for yourself and you also want to be an example a positive example because you know some people do a couple of months and come out and they don't really miss much mm -hmm. but when you've missed a lot of time it's a motivation to others to mm -hmm. show that you can get back and I heard the other other brothers up here on the platform say that you know and that's a big deal 
because people would have to have, you know, some type of encouragement, some type of, uh, you know, just hope. Right. So outside plug, the reason I made it an LLC, um, and this is nothing against nonprofit, but, but what I'm into, you know, it's a lot of advocate work. Um, I'm against the criminal justice system the way it's, it is now. It's a lot of things that obviously needs to be, you know, challenged. And I didn't want any restrictions. I understand. You know, yeah. so that's that's basically, you know, my whole thing with that. But um, like I said, um, this is a great opportunity for me. Um, and, you know, for what I'm trying to do, I feel like that it can really, you know, make a difference. And at the end of the day, you have to have a reason, a purpose mm. of why you're out here. You don't want to just be out here and, you know, yeah, you're paying the bills, but what are you living for? And that's what got me through. There's a point where you're able to pay the bills post, post-incarceration, post right? You come out and you, you're on what we call papers, you're on parole, and, and you know, you are fighting up against that. But before we move on with the conversation, I want to jump to Dustin Greaves, because one of the things that spoke to me about Rise Up Industries is that it's a voluntary pro, uh, program. It's not a program that either one of these gentlemen came out and were assigned to. This was not part of their release package. They, they were not mandated to the program. So Dustin, tell me, first of all, thank you for joining us. Tell me what you yeah. do for Rise Up Industries and um, a little bit about the program. So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dustin Greaves. I'm the machine shop manager for Rise Up Industries. Um, Rise Up, as Joseph and Kwan talked about, is uh, primarily a reentry program for post-detention uh, um, individuals. Um, <clears throat> I, run the, I run the machine shop. We run a uh, social enterprise. So we actually run a business within a nonprofit. Um, it's an 18 month paid training program. So when guys uh, like to, for, for what you said earlier, elect to come to Rise Up Industries, they fill out a job application just like any other job. It's just our program focuses on their reentry. So we try to, number one, the most important thing is we give them a skill. So we train them to be entry level CNC machinists, which is a very high paying in demand trade something that these guys can do the rest of their career. Um, that's the main focus of Rise Up Industries, but we surround them with those support services that we have, you know, over the past seven years continually added and, um, and, uh, and improved on to, to try to uh, alleviate their stress. Um, you know, as Joseph, Kwan, Andre, you guys can talk about coming out, coming out of prison is hugely stressful and reentering society. So we have um, counseling, uh, relapse prevention, um, drug and alcohol recovery, tattoo removal is available, um, mentorship, uh, life skills, financial literacy, you know, um, teaching, teaching guys how to use cell phones, you know, yes. I, mean, I mean, it's so stressful, uh, you know, as, as, as Joseph and Kwan could talk about and see the older guys, we've, we've had guys in our program do 40 years or more, um, and then come back to society. So, uh, our, the overall goal of Rise Up Industries is our goal is to reduce street gang, uh, violence in San Diego. So, Right now, uh, the only program we are offering is our reentry, but we intend in 2023 to start a gang prevention program, um, utilizing our graduates uh, and current members, Kwan and Joseph, to help us with that, to go out and speak and get uh, these at-risk youth and keep them from joining street gangs. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Rise Up is trying to cut the head and the tail off of the the street gang problem in San Diego County is our eventual overall goal. So Kawan, you said something that touched me. I actually made a note of it. Um, can you tell me the first time you had police contact? How old were you and what was it for? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe the first time I had police contact, um, I was either 11 or 12 years old. And it was for a, a, a assault 
and, and battery on school campus. Okay. Um, you know, at that time, my father had went just, he had went back to prison the first mm -hmm. time I had met him. So mm -hmm. he's only in my life for a year that he went back to prison. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know how to cope with that. I didn't know how to deal with those feelings and emotions other than uh, acting out. Um, at that time, my uncle, he was a drunk at that time. He's clean and sober now, but he was a drunk at that time. And uh, he was there watching us. So uh, life was kind of hard and difficult. You know, we didn't have, you know, uh, uh, we were not financial well off and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it was kind of like I was more susceptible to do that, to commit that crime and go to juvenile hall because of my circumstances. So that was definitely my uh, uh, first time having con uh, police contact with a uh, uh, police contact uh, was around 11 or 12. And um, yeah, and I just I can't help but believe that if you had the right people with the right services at the right time, that maybe that wouldn't have been your story, because what you said was you deserved to be punished. And I don't think anybody on this call is condoning crime. I don't think anybody here is saying that we should not atone for the things that we do. But I can't help but believe that at 11 or 12, if you had something different, if you had something other than juvenile hall, if yes. you had the same type of, of, of opportunities that you have with the Rise Up Industries, that maybe your outcomes would have been different. You know, who did you have to go to? I, I didn't have anyone. And, and, and just like you said, uh, uh, if, if I did have an alternative other than juvenile hall, it could, I could have had a different outcome as far as my, the impact on my overall life. Mm -hmm. I mean, the juvenile hall system is, is, is a failure in itself because it breeds animosity and a hostility. Uh, they throw you in a cell and, 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 and um, you know, I'm 11, 12 years old. I'm already come from a traumatic background dealing with abuse, uh, instability at the house, uh, 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 poverty, uh, uh, all types of other personal insecurities. I'm already dealing with these, these things. So, you know, they take me to juvenile hall and throw me in a cell and it just adds on to that. Right. You know, I'm already feeling like, okay, no one cares. No one gives a damn. Everyone is against me. And the juvenile hall system just affirms that, you know, mm -hmm. and it just, you know, when I, when I reflect back on it, I just remember sitting in the cell and all the rage, you know, uh, uh, feeling like no one cared, feeling like I've been abandoned, feeling like not only, you know, the people, you know, who are supposed to love me dropped the ball, but also society, the system that also dropped the ball because they didn't do anything to improve my, my, my situation or, or to understand, you know, uh, what my circumstances was to try to make it better. All they did is like, they forgot about me, threw me in the cell and said, okay, but I don't think that's healthy for an 11 year old, 12 year old kid. Cause it just, it just, it just adds on to whatever issues that we were going through already. And it adds on to those uh, feelings and uh, the unhealthy coping uh, uh, mechanisms that we develop, you know, from the circumstances that we come up out of. You and go back to surviving that. that's what you can do, right? Like at the end of the day, the only thing that's left for you to do at that point is survive. That's, that's it. Andre, right. I want to jump over to you because I know you spent two years on Rikers Island without- Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. Before being convicted of a crime. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Okay, so um, I live in the Bronx and the Bronx, you know, can be rugged depending on what part. <laughs> and um, I was with some friends and they were a little more aggressive and violent than I thought. But I knew them and you know, when you're from the neighborhood, you you know, you see a side to a person and you don't see them as dangerous or anything. They just your homies. Mm -hmm. And one thing led to the next, I'm in the car and it turns into a chase from the police. Shots are fired both ways. And although I didn't shoot and I didn't have a gun, the fact that I'm in that car with people, you're an accessory. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, thankfully I didn't get shot, but one of the guys in the car got shot. It was real ugly. So next thing I know, I got a 40 count indictment, attempt capital murder on police. Wow. Um, they throw me on Rikers Island and Rikers Island. It's um, usually two to three years before you can even go to trial. Anybody that's heard about Rikers, you know, mm -hmm. so wow. no bond, obviously, because of the nature of the crime. And when they throw me in there, it's really difficult because 
violence seems to be the only way you can deal with other people. There's no diplomacy. There's no let's talk about it. Let's reason it out. It's violence. So now I become worse. I become a real, I guess you could say thug or aggressive person because you're just trying to survive, like you said earlier. So um, some of the things were really barbaric that I had to do, you know, just to prevent, you know, myself from getting hurt. And the whole time you're thinking, I'm not going to get out of this. I'm going to get time for this. They're talking, you know, double digit numbers. And I'm just going to, you know, be like the rest of the guys and just survive and just, you know, establish myself as, you know, a solid guy or whatever. And you learn a lot and you see a lot and you realize you tap into things internally that you didn't know about yourself because now it's self-preservation. Right. So I'm sure the other guys know what I'm talking about. Your instincts take over, your security goes up, you know, and you just, you're really barbaric, but you don't see yourself as barbaric because everybody's barbaric. You're in an abnormal environment. Right. So this is the trauma. This is the trauma that you don't know is trauma. Because it's like normal to you because you're in an environment where it seems normal. Right. And even if you have support outside, you know, family, loved ones, it's not the same. They can't be in there with you. They can't hold your hand. They can give you, you know, commissary and come visit you. But at the end of the day, it's about you and however you maneuver in there to survive. So, you know, thankfully, um, after two years, you know, I went to trial and, um, my co-defendant, like I said, he was a homeboy. He grew up with me. He took his weight. He said, look, you know, you don't deserve this. I'm going to set you free. And he got on the stand and he told them exactly what happened. And he basically said he didn't have a choice. He was just in the car. And, you know, it was very emotional. He got a lot of time out of it. And, you know, I think the people really respected the fact that there's certain codes you have to go by. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn to just, no matter how wrong I, I, I felt, you know, this was towards me, I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't tell on him. I had to let him be the man to free me. So I had to do two years straight and just let the jury, you know, see what it was. And I got acquitted, fully acquitted. But now you come out and your whole mindset is different. Right. So now you're not, you're not thinking like it's no longer Andre prior to getting incarcerated, even though I wasn't guilty. Now I'm coming out and my street name was black. So now I'm coming out as black. Your, your whole thought process is different. So now you just caught up in wanting to do other criminal stuff and it destroys you. Yeah. But that's, 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 you know, I don't want to get too in depth. I'm sure you can imagine, but it's a hell of an experience, you know, and Rikers, although it's considered a jail for those who know about Rikers, it's like, it's more like a maximum prison yeah. because you have, you know, just different boroughs, different people repping different things. And the violence is just like unreal. It's surreal for real. So I'm just thankful that, you know, I was able to just survive it and, Maybe I needed to go through that to, you know, become the man that I am now, because that's, I see, you know, the younger people, they're in gangs, they, they're doing what they do, and they don't realize there's another part to this story. Right. You know, when you get, when you get behind those walls and behind those bars, it's different. Right. So, you know, I'm sure the other guys on the platform, you know, they understand we can, we can help and tell people. If, if you want to talk so-called street talk, I'll tell the younger guys or whatever, what do you think? I'm not gangster enough. Do you <laughs> want to hear some war stories? You know, yeah. so that's how you connect with them. Because if you, if you haven't lived it, they don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's where I'm at with it right now. Joseph, I want to, both of the other gentlemen have, have touched on that level of hopeless and helpless. Um, Tell me what it feels like when, you know, you're on the street, you're with your homies, you, 
we all have been in situations where we're looking for where we fit in. You know, you're, you're teen in, you're, you, you have different situations you're dealing with at home and you're looking for that place to fit in. Tell me what it was like to reach that point of helpless and hopeless for you and how you managed that. Um, I didn't manage it. Okay. It, that, you know, uh, just just to simply put it um like uh Kawan talked about it dealing with all of these different type of emotions um the insecurities dealing with the disadvantages that you you grew up with and um regardless of how great or significant they truly are um all of this lost on you you're only focusing on what you feel like you didn't get um, and so that's what you blow up in your mind. Um, and so you're dealing with all of these negative sort of uh, feelings that um, that are reacting with inside of you while dealing with other people in society. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to figure out who you are. You're trying to figure out uh, what you're supposed to be doing if you have purpose. Uh, if purpose is real, you're trying to discover if, if God is real, um, all of these sort of uh, things that put you in a uh, in a lost state mm -hmm. to not be able to identify who you are and, and truly to understand the value of other people. All right. So, you know, if you don't know who you are, you can't value uh, other people. And so for me, it was almost, uh, it, it felt like a slow death. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like my death was imminent. Uh, I felt like at some point, and, and I felt like this for a while, um, just because of some experiences that I've had and you know, people around me that I grew up with and how many of those guys ended up incarcerated or dead. I felt like, you know, either I was going to die or, or, or be locked up at some, I felt like it was inevitable. So for me, it, it felt like, um, it felt like the, the air was being let out of a balloon, uh, which, which was my life. And so every day I, you know, I, I felt like, uh, oh, this is a gift, you know, like uh, the, the fact that I'm alive, the fact that I'm, I'm not locked up, you know, but it, it's weird to talk about it now, you know, obviously with my mindset, that seems like all the more reason to go do something wonderful in life. But um, that that's a weight, it's heavy, especially when you don't know who you are. So uh, for me, it was, it was like, well, okay, uh, uh, it didn't happen yesterday, but it's gonna happen today. Um, and so, you find yourself in situations where um, Andre talked about it, uh, where you, where you, you sur you're surrounded by certain individuals, and and that mindset is is something that you've grown accustomed to. Um, the 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 type of individuals um, that you gravitate towards you or that gravitates toward you um relate to you in, in some kind of way and there's a comfort level that you have with these individuals and that they have with you but um from the outside looking in there may be some things that are jarring about them or about yourself but you don't you're not able to um properly deal with those things you don't look at this person and say man this this guy is dangerous i shouldn't be around him uh this guy is his mindset is ridiculous i know he's a torpedo he's going to end up crashing into something dangerous i shouldn't be around him but you find and for uh whatever reason whatever psychological reasoning is behind it um that's something that we grow numb to and we accept uh we're not able to see that clearly um and and for a lot of the youth today that grow up in uh, certain situations, similar circumstances to myself, I see them in the same place. Um, and, and 
you know, sometimes it's baffling for us. We're like, you know, you can't see that that's a bad idea. Um, and But it's not that simple. Mm-hmm. So it, uh, the feeling I had was a very um, uncertain, complicated, uh, um, deflating feeling uh, mm-hmm. that I had before I got incarcerated. So Dustin, you know, you you received them, right? You said you had a gentleman in the program who had done 40 years. You know, Joseph did eight years. We got 14 years. You dealt with young men like Andre who did 15 years. What is that experience like? I have to believe that there's just a certain level of brokenness that you guys receive at the outset. They don't know who to trust. They don't know what to trust. They don't know you know, they don't know how to use a cell phone. Like you said, there's Mm -hmm. so much learning and so much um, of the basic necessities. And I'm not talking about, you know, just having to live, but I'm talking about just the things that children and that people need to feel whole, to feel safe, to feel loved, to feel wanted, um, to have a certain level of security. How do your how does your program work at breaking down that wall that I'm sure initially walks into you guys' offices? Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's different for per for each individual, but uh, we've had some guys that uh, uh, I remember one of my guys who did forty some years. I told him two months in, I said, "Look, bro, I'm not a CO. <laughs> you know, I'm not." who you think I am, you know, I, I care about you uh, wholeheartedly. And I think for me personally, it's, uh, it's well, I, all these guys are my sons. Um, I consider them each and every one of them. I love them to death. Um, and it's just getting, it's very emotional, but uh, it's getting them to, to believe in themselves again. Um, Kwan and Joseph, obviously did a lot of work on themselves before they got to Rise Up Industries. Um, And, you know, we're just blessed to be able to, to give them that path to be, you know, to continue that success. Um, But it can be difficult. I mean, especially guys that do 20, 30, 40 years. I mean, it's, you know, they're locked. I had one of my guys tell me, he goes, Dustin, I, I was, I grew up in a bathroom. And, you know, I went, wow, you know, I mean, imagine that. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, the, what we're, what we are doing in our society. And I, and I, I'm the first to say crime, if you commit crime, it does need to be punished, but there should be some short sort of atonement, but 40, I mean, it just, what, <laughs> what we create at the back end of that is horrible. We, we're, we obviously are making it worse. Um, and so we got to do it differently. Um, that's my goal. I mean, you know, you know, we're doing it one guy at a time. Um, but you know, it's, uh, we have to do it differently. And then these guys, Joseph, Kwan, Andre, they go and create their own spider web. And eventually that web is bigger and bigger. And, and we keep these kids from, uh, you know, we give them hope. You know, it's, it's, you know, they are who God made them and, um, you know, they, they have, they have self-worth. And I think that's the biggest thing, you know, Kwan spoke about it, you know, 12 years old being thrown in a, in a, in a jail cell. It's like, come on, you know, (laughs) it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's there, there, there are other ways. There has to be other ways. Um, And, you know, we're, we're going to do our part to change it. Um, and you know, that's uh, Joseph and Kwan. No, you know, I, I live, I, you know, it's very much, it's my passion. You know, uh, I'm blessed to be here. I'm thankful. I read father Boyle's book tattoos on the heart and I applied for the job. You know, I never, I'm from a small town in Northeast Missouri of 2000 people. I never, I never experienced any of this. But I'm thankful to be here and uh, and can't look and can't wait to you know have more success stories. Go on, I have the million dollar question for you. <laughs> here it comes. 
How many of them homies you had when you were 12 that you <laughs> hanging with then that you got in trouble with are still your homies? Not one of them. Not a single one. And I'm grateful for it. I believe that uh, God is going to put the right people in my life. And the people who are not meant to be there, they're not going to be there. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why worry about them? You know, um, the people who are supposed to be in my life, they're here today and I'm grateful for them. You know, I'm grateful to meet you. Obviously, you're supposed to be in my life forever long. I don't know, but I'm grateful <laughs> for that. <you> know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I had the right people in my life today, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. So what would your message be to the youth out there who view their set, their homies, their corner partners, whatever they call them, what is your message to them? <laughs> That's a hard one for me to answer because I think about, you know, when I was younger and the reason why, you know, I turned to the homies because mm -hmm. I lacked that family dynamic. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that family structure in the house. You know, um, I didn't have too much love in the house. Uh, 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 and I have too many people I could rely on. But when I was running the streets and I'm out there with the homies, although it was a false sense of love, uh, 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 a misguided friendship, mm -hmm. but I felt connected to them, you know, mm -hmm. at that time. Although we're in the midst of our madness, uh, uh, um, but I can identify because we were all broken. We we're all going through something. Um, we all was, we're, we're, we're all struggling, you know? Um, so it's kind of hard to like tell the youth to say, hey, forget about your homies, knowing that I went through that and I know exactly what they're feeling and what they're going through. Uh, to just tell them to abandon that because that's something that I, I wanted that, that, that family, I wanted that the, uh, to feel important, to feel connected. Mm -hmm. However, I would tell the youth Instead of motivating each other to do wrong, let's motivate each other to do something right. Okay. You know, um, we live in a technology age today. And uh, back when I was running the streets, we didn't have a lot of exposure to certain things, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? To education tools. Uh, 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 uh. Only thing we was exposed to was the, the pimps, the gangsters, the hustlers. Now we're in a technology age. We can be exposed to anything that we want to. So I would tell the kids just, Continue to open your mind. Don't live in that box of, of, of the hood because it's, life is much more bigger than that. You know, um, it makes sense now. But when you get older, you realize that it doesn't make too much sense. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it was just a necessary step for me to get to the next chapter of my life. And if they look at it like that and, and, and inspire each other to do right in the midst of going through their own personal hellfire, and utilizes the tools that they have available to them, which is technology. And um, just keep an open mind and, and continue to expose yourself to different things other than the hood, other than the pimps, uh, 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 other than the hustling, you know, look at some physics stuff. Uh, um, like we have no excuses today, you know. Um, we have to, I, I, I look at it today, we're making a conscious choice to be a dumbass. Because okay. there's no excuses, you know. So I would just tell the youth just, don't live in that box. Life is much bigger than that. Um, you know, keep an open mind, be open to other people. Uh, 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 jump on a leap of faith, you know, uh, 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 expose yourself to different things. Go outside the box. Just go outside the box. Continue to strive and inspire each other to, to do better. You know, that, that, that'd that be my message. Uh, life is much more bigger than the hood. Andre, so you have made a conscious choice to almost re-traumatize yourself regularly because you have now chosen in a different way, but to continue to go, in, to, to go back to the places that traumatized you to bring others out. Tell me how you maintain your mental health. Tell me how you maintain um, feeling whole while you go back into the prisons and the group homes and, you know, juvenile detentions 
and Rikers, what do you do to make sure that your mindset stays on course? It's not easy. Um, basically, um, I've accepted that it's like a calling. And I've accepted that I have to go through certain things that maybe some people or most people can't go through. You know, um, everybody has, I guess you could say a skill set or a certain thing about their personality. You know, I never was in a game. Mm -hmm. And my only reason was because I never wanted anybody to make my decisions for me. Okay. You know, um, and it's no disrespect. But it's just that, you know, you got higher rankings, big homies or whatever. And no matter if you want to do it or not, you have to. Or you find out later that the set wasn't right or this person wasn't right, you know. So I just feel like the way I'm living now, and it is traumatic. You know, I, I went um, last year, into last year, I had to go all the way to Mississippi mm -hmm. to see a... Um, uh, inside felon. And let me just say real quick, because I know a lot of people are kind of confused with that terminology. Mm -hmm. I use IF and OF, inside felon and outside felon, just to bring awareness that you're still a felon. Because a lot of people will say he's an ex-felon. And you're really not an ex-felon. There's still limitations on what you can do. And the guys that have been there know what I mean. So that's just, you know, something I wanted to do create this acronym just to bring awareness to it. And I feel that if you've been through it, then you would understand. But back to what I was saying, um, yes, it's, I went to um, Mississippi, um, Yazoo City, way out there. Yeah. And it really spooked me out. You know, just coming in the middle of nowhere and going through the security and them doors close again, you know, it's, 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 it's really something. But when you see the response that you get, that guy's in there, and specifically the person I went to see, say, man, this guy came back. They didn't leave me. They didn't forget about me. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the, the driving force for me. You know, don't think there's not tears. There's tears. There's moments where, you know, I just got to deal with it in my own way. I'm a big sports guy. I love music. I zone out and do my own thing to get my mind right. I had to prepare myself for this because I'm, again, I'm taking my mind back to those dark moments. But the motivation, and I'm sure Joseph and Kawan can say the same thing, when you know you're doing something for your people so they don't have to be so confused or go through what you had to go through to get to this spot. That's that's what keeps you going. That's yeah. the driving force. So I'm not going to say it's easy and I'm not going to say it's for everyone. That'd be lying. And I try to be transparent about it. You know, it might not be for you. But for me, this is what I chose to do. Um, the mental aspect of it, um, you know, you got different you got different types of hustlers, different type of people doing criminal activity. So while there are a lot of these younger people in gangs and stuff like that. But there's also people like me that was just hustlers, selling drugs. You know, um, the gang life got a little more popular in the last few years. But, you know, I'm from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, really popping like that. It was just clicks, your boys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're hustling, you're doing your dirt or whatever. So you don't want to, like he's like like Joseph said, you don't want to just stay boxing to anything. You want to address this problem to everybody, and unfortunately, especially people of color, because you know the way our our upbringing is set up for the most part is is different. We're mm -hmm. urban, so you know, like Dustin said, you know, he he never had to deal with that in a small town. But when you're living in these metropolitan urban areas, it's so many influences. So many things coming at you. So you want to just, you know, express yourself in a way where people could say, you know, I can, I can relate. That could be me. You know, he's, he's given a general, you know, understanding and description of the way, you know, 
society has created this product of environment, you know, for whatever the circumstances are. So um, I'll deal with the trauma. I'll shed my tears. And by the way, I have a, a, a very loving family. I'm married. You know, I have three kids, two grandkids. Um, it's a little shaky sometimes trying to explain to them what I'm going through mentally because it's different things. It could be the littlest thing. You might just be walking down the street and somebody just moves a little funny. And you just focused on them. And then my wife is like, Dre, what, what, what's wrong? And then you come back, you know? So they still, you know, have to figure you out, so to speak. But that was a blessing I had. You know, I couldn't have done this without my family. And, you know, I was also fortunate to have um, what they call a day one. My day one was a real day one. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was there <laughs> a real day one from, I don't know, he was about four years old. <laughs> and he never, you know, got into the criminal world. He was, you know, ironically into law enforcement. Yeah. He came to see me. He took care of me, you know. He's in my life right now. He's going to be in my life until God says otherwise. So I had that blessing. And I had that so-called um, voice of reason. Like somebody that I could respect saying, Dre, you got, you're too smart. You got you to gotta switch it up. You know, this ain't working. So, you know, I just, I just find a way every day to get through the mental traumas and, you know, um, remember what I'm doing this for. That's why I said you have to have a purpose. And when Dustin was saying earlier, it's a passion. It makes you emotional. If you don't have the passion, then you're in the, long, you're in the wrong line of work. Right. I see your passion, Kimberly. Everybody's passion. You have to have the passion. This is not, for me, it's not a job. Yes, you want to pay the bills. You want to survive. You want to take care of your family. I get that. But it takes more than that to do this. Yeah. So if you just want a regular job, Hey, there's a million and one jobs you can sign up for. This here is not for everybody. And I just, you know, appreciate everybody on this platform. You know, hopefully, you know, some of the viewers and listeners will really understand. Um, and we can really, you know, show them that that we have to we have to do something. Somebody has to, you know, take a stance and, you know, change the dynamics of what's going on because it's it's repetitive right. and the recidivism is is continuous. And, you know, I didn't do just one, what they say, bid, you know, recidivism, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But when you hit the bottom of the bottom, meaning that I didn't, I didn't just, you know, you start off these little bits and camps and, mm -hmm. you know, small incarcerations. But when you hit the big boy house, the maxes, the super maxes, you know, and that's another conversation, but when you hit them spots and you know, everybody's got multiple life sentences, don't care. People that you see on TV, I'm sitting next to people and I'm looking at them on TV and they're deemed a serial killer or whatever. And you, you're on the yard with them, you know, it changes everything. So, you know, I'm just going to keep pushing until, you know, I can't push anymore until the body just breaks down and hopefully that'll be a, a long time from now. And, now I got some new um, people I've met and, um, you know, we can collaborate and we can, you know, brainstorm together and just keep chiseling at that wall, that brick wall. Right, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Joseph, Andre used the term IF and OF, inside felon, outside felon. Tell me about the moment you became an outside felon and what that felt like for you leaving prison um, and some of the steps that you took to releasing the mindset though your physical was out of out of jail <clears throat> um i'm glad you you asked about the mindset um because that's the most important thing all right before incarceration during incarceration after incarceration if your mind is not where it needs to be um then you're subjected to your circumstances right uh and, and so we, we say this all the time for those of us who have done time 
I, there's some people who are physically free, but in prison mentally. And so for me, um, I'm talking this evening uh, for our uh, Rise Up's Big Night Out, which is a fundraiser we do annually. Um, but I'm going to be talking about uh, comfort. And one of the puzzling things for me was I spent all of this time, all of my time being locked up from county jail to prison, thinking about what it would be like once I was out. And I thought, you know, all of these feelings, all of these emotions that I'm having to deal with, all of this baggage that I'm having to carry, um, all of these, uh, these things that you say, this is unfair, uh, it's not right, this is not justice, you know, and all of the stuff that you carry with, that you've been carrying, right, since you can remember, um, you think it's going to all fall off the moment you walk out. You think it's going to go away. That's not the case. And so for me, I couldn't understand why I didn't feel free. I didn't feel like all of these, these weights were lifted off of my shoulders. And it was like, okay, I could eat what I wanted to eat. I could go to the beach. I could put my feet in the sand and in the water, all these things that I imagined and dreamed about for years. And I'm actually doing it. And it's not giving me the satisfaction that I thought it would give me. The food didn't taste the way I thought it was going to taste. <laughs> and so something was holding me back. Something was bothering me uh, about that. And, and so it was really my mental approach. What had happened was I decided I needed to be mentally strong while I was incarcerated because there was no other way for me to survive. And then when I got out, I thought I could switch that off. But it doesn't work like that. Um, it, it has to stay on the whole time. And so now realizing that I've been able to enjoy life more. I've been super thankful for my wife, for my family, for the people around me. I've been appreciative. I've been able to really um, take life by, by the handlebars and, and just like, and, and enjoy it completely. Those feelings that I, I thought I was going to get the moment I stepped out of the gate, um, I'm starting to experience that now. But it's only because I realize I've got to keep my routine. I have to keep my regimen. I have to make sure that I'm mentally sharp, that I'm working on myself because the pitfalls that were present for me in prison still remain today. And so that was something I needed to realize uh, uh, becoming an outside felon. Uh, and, and so it's, it's that the mindset that I had um, didn't work for me only because I was in prison. It, 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 it travels. It'll work for you anywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're a CEO of a Fortune 500 company or whether you're in middle school, right? Whether you're, um, whatever it is that you do um, in prison, like it, it doesn't matter if, if you make sure that your mental um, stability is there and you're taking care of your mental health, you're taking care of yourself mentally on a daily basis. It's not something that you get to, take, uh, get to turn off or take a break from. It's something that you have to make sure it's, it's, uh, it's self-care, it's hygiene, it's like brushing your teeth. It's not something that you stop doing. It's something you do every single day. And so that helps prepare you to deal with your circumstances, no matter how significant you think they are. Mm. Okay. That, that, I mean, there's so much I could take from that. There's so much I yes. can pull out of that. Um, just, just that feeling. Kawan, we've watched you. You got your baby there a month old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're are you a first time dad? I'm a first time dad. First time. <laughs> Congrats. I love it. <laughs> tell me, tell me what that felt like. What does it feel like to to have hope in your offspring? Tell me what what you're feeling right now. What are the things you want to do 
so much different than what you had is is what are you feeling being a dad all types of emotions <laughs> emotions i haven't even that i didn't even know was there um you know, i'm excited you know it was unexpected it wasn't planned but but my daughter is here and i have to step up and be a father and i plan to be the best father possible you know and um making sure that I give her the necessary tools for life that I'm preparing her for life mm -hmm. for, you know, from when I'm gone, you know, that she's able to govern life and, and, and be successful and make healthy decisions and stuff. And um, yeah, I just want to give her everything that I've never had, you know, and, and give her so much love. Uh, uh, um, I want to uh, give her so much knowledge. You know, I want her to be super smart. I want her to be known by her intelligence, not by her physical appearance. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and she has plenty of uh, 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 black women role models. You know, my mother is a supervisor. Uh, my cousin runs her own business. My my grandmother started two charter schools in L.A., uh, couple businesses, wrote a uh, uh, couple books. My auntie wrote a couple books and have businesses on a Christian Trinity uh, uh, broadcasting network. Mm -hmm. So she has plenty of examples of uh, how to be a uh, uh, a successful black woman, you know, she she has no shortage of that. And I want her to be exposed to that, be exposed to things that I've never been exposed to as a kid, you know, so she can start thinking that that's possible. You know, that's one of the things that I didn't have. I didn't, I wasn't exposed to uh, doctors in my community. I wasn't exposed to uh, 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 lawyers in my community. I was exposed to the gangsters, the bloods, the crips, the Southsiders, you know, the, uh, the pimps, the players, the hustlers. So my way of thinking, this is the, this was my limitation. This was my choice. This was my option of what I can be. And I want to show her, it's like, no, I want to expose her to many things as possible so she can start dreaming of higher, higher, higher platforms. You know, she can start dreaming about accomplishing anything that she puts her mind to. But I know I have to expose her to that. I have to put her in an environment and, 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 and put her around people that so she can see that, like, okay, this is possible. This is a goal. So I just want to do the opposite of how I was raised, you know, give her different exposures than what I was exposed to. Andre, you and I grew up in the same neighborhoods. Um, yes. And I think that there's a uniqueness to New York City and how projects are run and, and um, you know, it's nothing to have 10, 20 buildings as part of a project and anywhere from 20 apartments and 20 stories high. So there's a lot of people housed in, in a specific area. And we know that the socioeconomic background of those people is usually low income because they're living in the projects. Um, right. You have children, I, you have grandchildren, so you have adult children. Tell me how you have done exactly what Kawan has said, expose them to other things, change the perception of their environment such that they change the perception of their mind. Well, now that's a good question. Um, I attribute a lot of things to their mother, but as far as the boys go now, um, the youngest son is, uh, he's 24 years old, engineering degree, did the right thing, um, graduated from NYT, very proud of him. But he comes to me and says, uh, Pop, I, I, I have a passion for for drawing, illustrating. Um, he loves art and really computer savvy. I can't even get into the depths of that with him. But um, I just felt like, you know, you want to teach people to be happy. You want to teach people, even if it's your family, you want to show them that life is about being happy. I didn't want him to just, you know, work a job to, to pay the bills or to get money. And he's not really filling his void. He's not really happy. So just to piggyback on what Kawan was saying, if you really enjoy what you're doing with your life, you're gonna be good at it and you'll probably be successful at it. So, you know, most of the people in our neighborhoods and our neck of the woods, they're not doing crime because they wanna do crime. It's not like, you know, I, I just wanna risk myself or whatever. They don't know no other way. And you just you just want to just show people even, you know, because to be honest with you, my family was very supportive when I was growing up. But the influences overwhelm and it overpowers 
even if you have that that one or two or three people in your family it, it overpowers it you know like you said we grow up you're talking about what you would say is skyscrapers big buildings many people all congested in one area so while you're getting this this positive influence from whether it's your family or whether it's school as soon as you come out the door now you're on the block you're going to the store you know wherever you're going if you, if, if you live around trains you know new york got a big subway system you're on a train you're on the bus all these you're seeing things you're visual you see the the clothing they're wearing we're saying gear you want that you want the fly gear and you want the gold and stuff like that so you have to be able to say you know what and that's what i teach you know my kids what i really want in life is this if that's what you really want then you got to put in the work so i approach my kids and i try to approach you know other people even so-called street gangsters hustlers whatever what do you want if you're just trying to obtain a nice car jewelry have the chicks if you're a guy then your goals are very limited you have to have people really reflect on where you where you going with this you know so that's my advice to people know what you want and you know even if it's different if it's making you happy then that's all that matters it's about happiness so many people and you know this yourself kimberly so many people have you know, six figure salaries or whatever, still unhappy. Don't even like the job. Or don't like the supervisor. <laughs> or don't like the co-workers. You know, and I, I just feel life should be about happiness. If you're happy, you're gonna be a good person. You're gonna be able to be cordial to other people. You're gonna be able to respect others. But if you're bitter, and see that's what I had to overcome. This is just me. I was bitter. So my bitterness was so overwhelming that I really was dangerous because I didn't, I didn't care. All of this bitterness, so you have to get to the depths of the mental illness, the trauma. Like I always say, people that so-called bully people, they bully people because they're unhappy, because they're bitter about something. You have to get to the bottom of why that bully's acting like a bully, why that so-called stick-up kid is acting like that so that's what i had to you know figure out about myself why i'm so bitter and once you get rid of the bitterness whether it's the haters people didn't do you right whatever whatever got you bitter once you get over that now you can really elevate as a human being and just say you know what that's their problem you know they didn't treat me right or whatever but it's all about me now. It's all about bettering myself so I can be the person I really want to be. And that's where I'm at with it. So I want to ask uh, Dustin a question before we go to the questions from the audience. Um, Andre touched on something that I think is important to, to kind of delve into a little bit. It's the right now mentality, right? You deal with a, a lot of young people who um, they need something right now right? Shoplifters need something right now, or some of them at least. Um, you, people who are sticking people up for money, sometimes it's a right now need. How does Rise Up Industries deal with the right now needs that allow your participants to make it the 18 months to completion of the program? But yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good question. Well, you know, one thing, and um, the, the, what makes Rise Up unique is we are a paid training program. So we pay these guys 40 hours a week from the, from the moment they start. And they're getting paid whether they're going through counseling or tattoo removal or are working in the machine shop. So it doesn't, as long as they're at Rise Up or they're uh, part of, you know, we, we, we pay guys to go down and speak to youth. Um, you know, so it's, the first thing we take care of is we give them a, a job. Um, so it does help relieve the stress. Although, you know, the, the guys start out at minimum wage, although next week we're, the, the, the salaries are going up by $2 an hour, uh, thankfully. Um, but, um, um, you know, we, we give them a job. So, and, and we help them, you know, with, you know, their budgeting, you know, because I think, you know, financial stress, 
um, and, and we all have it, no matter what, uh, leads to bad, can lead to bad choices. Um, so we do try to um, take care of that first and foremost. And then to get through 18 months here, as Joseph could speak to, as Kwan, it's not easy. Um, you know, and I know the, the, both these guys have had, uh, you know, ups and downs through their 18 months. For me, it's just uh, speaking to the guys and, 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 and letting them know that at the end of 18 months, there's another journey and, and, and that's the beginning of your career. Um, and that career uh, can be very rewarding. Uh, I tell the guys all the time, this trade will give you everything you give it. Um, maybe not right away, but it will give it to you. Um, you know, I've been very successful, thankfully, in, in, in my career. And, and I, I have no doubts that all these guys uh, will be successful in theirs as well. So. Thank you so much. So I want to go to a few questions from the audience. Um, Joseph, this is for you. How do you find out who you are? How can you help others uncover who they are? Thanks. Uh, I saw that one from Sharwanda. I was going to try to answer it. I didn't know when you were going to get to Q&A. Uh, but I, I had to, first of all, I had to deal with uh, reality. I had to deal with where I was. Um, and until you deal with the facts, um, you can't get to this place of understanding yourself um, because we we deal a lot in uh, in emotion. We deal a lot in uh, in theory, right? We have this theoretical idea of who we are, who we want to be, who we've been told that we are. Um, so you're dealing with all of these uh, instances, conditioning right from your neighborhood from your parents from uh social media from tv from all of these different sort of images that you want to project onto yourself and so you start to believe that you're this or you're that um and you have to be be careful of that um for me i was i was isolated right i was i'm in a cell um and there's no more uh lonely of a place than being in the middle of a of a cell man and and so being able to being able to quiet the noise uh called the white noise of what everybody else is saying about you um and, and then dealing with the facts okay where am i i'm in prison that means i did something wrong right um what did i do okay well i was a part of hurting people and taking from people okay well why did i do that um i did that because i thought that's who i was why did i think i was that person well these are the influences that i had in my life these are the things that i thought were acceptable this is what i thought it meant to grow up the way that i did and and to be who i was i thought it was acceptable to the people who welcomed me in like Kawan said these are the people who didn't find any fault with me these are the people who thought i was the the coolest dude in the world these are the people who thought i was dope so i it, it enhanced that uh those negative uh stereotypes that i placed upon who i was upon my life upon my own character right these things that oh well he got a nice car he got all the women, all of these things that mean nothing, but you're receiving, uh, you're receiving affirmations from these people based on these things that mean nothing. And so you gravitate to that. You want more of that. And so you find yourself, uh, you find yourself feeding that. And, and, and so I had to come to a place to where I had to evaluate uh, what was important in my life. Um, and, and if you can, if you can't get to the place where you can say, okay, this is important and this is not important, then you'll never truly be able to understand who you are. I had to be able to separate what was, um, what was carnal, what would pass away from those things that 
uh, that are not those things that are everlasting. And so if until I could do that, I couldn't I couldn't uh, decipher what was true about myself. I couldn't tell whether it was just something that I had accepted that society said about me, you know, being put in handcuffs at 11 years old on a cop car for doing absolutely nothing but standing outside talking to my brothers. And, and is this who I am? Uh, or am I who God said that I was when I didn't feel like doing it, but he said, you know, you can do these things. You can get through school. You can be a blessing to people, even when you don't feel like it. That came from somewhere. That wasn't what was projected about me because of the neighborhood I grew up in, because of the color of my skin. Those things weren't always being echoed. They were by my parents, like Andre said, by my parents, by, you know, certain people, a, a few people at school, people in the neighborhood. They were they would say those things. But by and large, that's not the 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 majority uh, of the the comments that you have directed towards your life. Usually it's a you bombarded with what you're not what you're uh, not capable of doing. And if they are telling you what you what you can do, then they're telling you you could you could be like everybody else around you. And so being able to quiet all of that noise and then say, OK. This these are the small whispers that I heard that are sort of against the grain. Let me see what this is. Let me study. Let me meditate. Let me let me spend some time investing into these small voices to make them greater. So if it doesn't pan out, then that's not who I am. I, I am exactly who they said I was. But if this changes my life, then turns out this is who I was the whole time. And so having to deal with that, that's how I was able to find who I was by not dealing. You, you have to understand that emotion has its place. So recognizing that I feel this way because of this, like this is why I, I was angry or this is why I was hurt because of these things happening. So deal with those things that caused that emotion and not dealing with the emotion itself. Uh, it, it so it doesn't invalidate the emotion, but it, it it also uses the emotion as a barometer to gauge what's been happening to you, and not saying that okay, this is just I'm justified in, in being angry at everybody, or I'm justified in in being numb and not caring about anything. Those things are unhealthy. That's not a a, a healthy process of dealing with your emotion. So being able to do that, being able to disseminate. Uh, that this is truly who I am. These are the values that I hold. And so if, if everything was to go away, are these things going to remain? If I have a child, do I want to instill these things in my child? These are, are the, the identifiers that help you understand, okay, this is who I truly am. And so I came to that place um, in part because I was able to be in a place where I was isolated and I, I wasn't able to hear other people's noise. It can be very difficult when you're in school every day and you're hanging around your homies and, and you're watching TV, you're watching, you're on social media, you're on IG, you're on Facebook every day, all day, every day. There, there's no quiet place for you. There's no place you can go to say, okay, now I can separate you know, who I truly am from those things that are being said about me. Uh, it's, it's difficult to do that. And so um, that's how I was able to um, find out who I was. Thank you for that, Joseph. We have a couple more questions I want to go to. Um, one says, when one deals with a traumatic background and gets thrown into prison, it's hard to cope with life. It's not healthy. And one should want to live and enjoy life without going about their day on survival mode. Does the program also provide mental health services? So I think Dustin, you touched on that some, but can you just go into some more detail about um, that process? I think I heard you say that um, they're paid even if they're not in, in the, the machine shop and they're going through the other components of the program. So tell us a little bit about how that works. Uh, sure, so uh, we, um, we have counseling in fact, when guys start, um, 
they're, we, we, we mandate them to go through five or six sessions, I can't remember, of, of counseling. Um, and then it's up to they, them whether they want to continue it. And we have two different counselors. One is talk therapy, and then we have a, a retired psychologist who, who does a lot of EMDR, which is, uh, deals with a lot of post-traumatic stress and, and things of that nature. Um, and, and, you know, um, you know, then we have our classes, you know, we start every Friday morning with a book club where we go through a book called Discovering the Laws of Life. Um, so we sit down as a group, we ask the guys to read a chapter, and then they discuss that as a group. Um, so there's, there's all, there's, there's, there's those types of counseling type, uh, the recovery meetings, relapse prevention meetings, the members hold their own meetings that are member led um, and they challenge each other. So I think, and, and then it, it's the family culture um, of just being real. You know, we put everything on the table. Um, we run a business, but if someone has an issue, the machines stop and we take care of the issue. Um, we do not let things go. I mean, you know, as Quan and Joseph will tell you, I do a lot of counseling. I talk to these guys all day, every day. I want to know what's going on um, because, you know, one little small thing to someone who did 40 years in prison um, and they're very vulnerable, um, you know, can lead to a big thing. And so, um, you know, I make sure and, my, and, the, and the people, the staff and the program make sure that, you know, it, we, we, <laughs> we don't just let things go. So we address it. And uh, to what Joseph was saying, you know, uh, given that self-worth, I think um, once someone has that, or, 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 un, or uncovers it, uh, sky's the limit, you know, so. Thank you. Uh, Andre, yes. um, tell us a little bit if someone wants to know about the process of being a spokesperson for individuals who are incarcerated now. So um, I'm sure as an outside felon, there's probably a process that you have to go through in order to be able to even go into the prisons and speak to the community. So can you give others some ideas who are interested in um, doing this type of mentorship, what the process is? Yes. Um, even without, you know, having um, an entrepreneurship set up, you can get in contact, you know, with the warden of that particular prison. And every prison has different um, criterias. And it depends on if you're trying to just go see an individual or you're trying to really go in and do like a motivational speaker thing, um, background check, you know, your status, security. Security is always a priority with prison. So once you overcome the security barriers of that, it shouldn't be a problem. You know, most, most prisons have these days a reentry program set up and they'll direct you through that. And it, it's, it's pretty much, it's pretty simple. The thing is, um, you have to prepare yourself for the red tape, you know, just, the, uh, you know, checking you out and, you know, the rules, because even though you're free, now you're on their turf. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a little disturbing. If they take you all the way around the Mayberry Bush, it's not like you can just say, I just want to come in and speak. So other than that, um, it's not a real, you know, issue. Um, for me, it was different because I've been inside so long. So, you know, I just had to deal with the mental things. And then again, I, I can't really say what it feels like to go in a prison if you've never been in prison. You know, that might be traumatic in itself, you know, so just know your triggers and know, know you know, your strengths and weaknesses as far as dealing with that type of thing. You don't want to go in there and just have a meltdown <laughs> and you're supposed to be a motivational speaker of some sort. But I, I would recommend it. I think it's a great experience. And if nothing else, it shows people that you care. That's a big deal. Even if you've never been incarcerated, never been in trouble, it makes the IFs know someone out there cares. And that that in itself is priceless. Thank you. Uh, 
Come on. So um, this question is, can anyone comment on the uprising crime due to the mental, uh, mental health issues of inmates being released? Um, Joseph spoke a little bit about this, but I'll have you chime in on it as well. You did a, a really long uh, bit in, in prison and then you're released. Tell us about that transition for you and why you believe so many people coming out have such an uptick in mental health breakdowns. Well, we most, of, most people incarcerated come from a traumatic background already. Then they go through the, the prison system and added trauma is, 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 is added to that trauma that they already have. So now you're getting out of prison with no ID, you know, with, 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 with none of the necessities that help you get back on your feet, but you're also getting out with all types of mental issues, trauma that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And there's really not too much guidance to address that out here once you get that 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 transition from getting out of a um, from being institutionalized then transitioning back out to society there's not too many programs that really help with that other than rise up they try to address that issue mm -hmm. so for me getting out you know a lot of my issues were social anxiety you know i felt uncomfortable being in in, in, in large gatherings particularly Walmarts, Targets and stuff. I remember when I first got out, my parents took me to Target and they said, get whatever you want. I didn't know what to do because I had so much anxiety because I'm not used to it. I didn't know, I just stood there and I, and I felt uncomfortable and I still feel uncomfortable. I'm still going through my, uh, um, my trauma of, uh, of trying to transition back in society as far as uh, from a social aspect. And, um, <laughs> it's kind of um it's a challenge i would say it's <laughs> it's a challenge i would say that uh like joseph said like doing things inside while you're incarcerated preparing yourself mentally helps when you get out of here mm -hmm. and re just remembering when you're incarcerated that it starts there it doesn't you can't you can't rely on anyone else to um come and save you you have to start the process you have to start thinking about that you have to start thinking about your own mental health and that's one of the things that I did, you know, although I still go through my uh, 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 my PTSD or, or, or my trauma at all, um, I'm able to uh, cope with it and deal with it and manage it in healthy ways where I'm not going off on the deep end or, uh, or getting too aggressive with someone who, 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 who makes me mad out in society. I have enough coping skills because I understood when I was incarcerated that, you know what, eventually I'm going to get out. You know, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, give up and, and go into despair and like, oh, this is, my life, I'm in prison, I'm never going to get out and succumb to my circumstances. I always had the mentality that, you know what, I'm going to get out eventually. So I'm going to start preparing myself mentally for this opportunity. And when that, when that opportunity finally came, I was prepared, even, even in the midst of my struggles. Thank you. Thank you. So just uh, one more question, or maybe two more questions before we close out. Joseph, I'm going to start with you, and I would like the entire panel to answer this question. Um, how did you forgive yourself? How did you shed the shame and the embarrassment, the hurt? How did you forgive yourself so that you were able to receive forgiveness from others? First and foremost, I had to uh, accept it and, and deal with um, the, the truth. Of, of what happened. Um, and I don't go into uh, detail about what happened unless, you know, somebody really wants to know. Um, and I don't have any problem answering questions, but, you know, usually um, our cases are like us, like human beings, they're complicated. And so dealing with the the truths the the things that actually took place um allowed me to embrace um the the unfairness um those those things about the justice system um and about society that are placed on individuals that have not done anything wrong and also accept uh my part and my fault 
and and know what I did do um, and know also uh, that I missed an opportunity with these young black men who were looking up to me to snatch them up and say, this is not how you're supposed to conduct yourself. And this is how you should conduct yourself. But when you're in a position where um, you're not conducting yourself in the right way, it's, it's difficult to do that. You can't really do that. So first of all, dealing with the truth of the situation, um, then after being able to do that, uh, then I, I, I can understand that God is real. So if God forgives me, then I can get to a place where I can forgive myself. Um, I can't make anyone forgive me. I can hope that they forgive me. Um, but that's on them. That's part of their journey. That's part of um, a place that they have to get to. You know, and whether they get to that place or not has absolutely no uh, bearing on what I've been commissioned to do in life. And so who I'm supposed to be, how I'm supposed to be a blessing to the people around me, how I'm supposed to add value to the people and to the organizations that I'm a part of, my community, my neighborhood, that has absolutely nothing to do with that. Um, and so understanding that uh, got me to a place to where I can say, okay, I can't be focused on what's in the rear view. Um, getting to a place of contrition uh, to where I don't want that to happen again. So in order for me to make sure that not only I don't end up in that place again, but that other individuals don't end up in that place, I'm doing everything I can to fight against that mental uh, fog of, of uh, I think, <laughs> was it was it Kawan who said, uh, you're making a conscious effort to be a dumbass like that that sort of <laughs> that sort of accepting uh this idiotic um uh, belief <coughs> I'm fighting against that every single day by taking care of myself mentally making sure that my relationship with God is good so that I can then make sure that the relationship with the people around me is good and so that's that's something that I have to continually do um, and, and if I'm truly contrite, all right, if, if, if I, if I truly want and desire their forgiveness, then that's exemplified in my conduct and how I carry myself, um, and how I treat people, um, not just because I, I wanted to get out or, um, or, I, you know, or I want the parole board to think that I'm, I'm sorry, or, you know, like it, it's not a game. It's something that I, I, I have honestly accepted and that I believe in. I don't Come know on. if that answered the question or not. It did. You know, it did. Um, I, I, I think that you, you make a great point. Um, how we forgive ourselves for the things that we've done can't be, um, it has to be separate and apart from how others view us, right? We have to let go of the things that we find um that we find hard to deal with about ourselves and so no that was a great answer to the question Kwan, i'm going to ask you to answer the same question how did you get to the point where you forgave you uh like joseph said acceptance then empathy you know um i have to accept those primary feelings you know, uh, uh, my traumatic past. Not accepting those feelings, I try to mask them with, with 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 secondary feelings, anger, resentment, and stuff, and that starts to have an impact upon my 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 behavior. Mm -hmm. But once I'm able to accept that, I'm able to move to a place of forgiveness to myself, for myself. You know, and it's only through that acceptance then it allows me to start taking the necessary actions where it's reflected in my actions that I'm forgiving myself, you know? So I start making better decisions, but it has to start with, 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 with like Joseph said, I, ha I, have to, I have to accept it. Then I have to take responsibility. Then I have to put myself in the, uh, uh, you know, the shoes of the people who I was terrorizing, you know? And I have to uh, uh, put in, that the, the work, I have to put in the action. My, 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 my behavior has to reflect this. 
you know. So that's how I did it. The, the same way Joseph did it is acceptance. Last question, Andre, this is for you. I want you to tell me the differences between reform and punishment. So, and I'm asking you this question because again, you have an opportunity to go actually into the prisons. The prisons are designed to punish, but you're going in to help with reform. Tell me how you're counteracting the punishment aspect and interjecting the reformer. Okay, the punishment really is just almost robotic. You know, you, you wake up and you're told to do this, that, and the other, or you can't do this, that, and the other, and you don't really have to think about it because it's already laid out for you. And if you don't do what they structure you to do, you're punished. If, if you want to go outside and it's not rec call, you're punished. If you want to eat this particular meal and they give you this particular meal, it's all punishment. So punishment is something you don't really have to think about or plan or anything of that nature. When you reform someone, now you're teaching them how to think. You're teaching them how to love themselves. You're teaching them how to educate themselves. You're teaching them how to just um, not be arrogant, but be confident. Because, and just to piggyback on the other question, you have to accept that you're a perfect example of an imperfect being. So once you understand that about yourself and people, then you can you can really grasp on a life because it's like mistakes are gonna happen. Somebody might not see the right way to deal with this situation, or I might not see the right way to deal with this situation. Why? Because we're flesh, we have choice. We're not animals, we don't move off just instinct. You know, we we have the opportunity unfortunately sometimes to say i'm gonna go left or i'm gonna go right i'm gonna go down this block or that block so when you reform you just want to show people that you know you can't move in a robotic state i know you're in prison but you still can educate yourself you can rehabilitate yourself you can learn things that might be assistance for you when you get out um you can practice you know your your social skills you know, it's not just IFs, you know, there's staff, there's, you know, there's counselors or whatever, even CEOs. I never blamed the CEO for me being in there. I never was that type of person to be like, you know, F the CEO or whatever. I, I, I never had that mindset because they were just like me. To, the way I saw it, they just had a job in the prison system, you know, so that's, that's all a part of reforming. That's all a part of just understanding where you stand with yourself in life and what you need to do to be a better person, what you need to do to be prepared when you come out. You know, nobody's going to be able to just um, lay it down for you. You have to take the initiative to say, you know, um, OK, I can't control this and I can't control that. But what can I control? What can I do to make me a better person? So like Kawan said, he prepared itself mentally, that, that, that can't be overlooked. You can't take that lightly. Preparing yourself mentally when you're in prison to come back out and reincorporate yourself with society. So I don't know every single step he took, but I have an idea, you know, because that entails, like I said, education, um, studying, um, asking questions, um, getting your support group together, all of the above. So, you know, these are all part of uh, reforming skills that, you know, I can show people. And, you know, if they really want to do that, then then it'll work for them. All right. So we've reached time. You know, we could talk about this all day. We have just <laughs> surfaced. Um, but I do want to be respectful of people's time. I want to give each one of you gentlemen an opportunity to close out. I'm going to actually start with Dustin. If you're in the San Diego area and you or a loved one want to get involved with Rise Up Industries, tell us how they can get in contact with the program. Um, the easiest way is to go to our website. It's riseupindustries.org. Um, and uh, there's contact information there. 
and uh, give us a call, write us an email. We will respond. Um, and, um, you know, and then we go from there. As far as for, uh, to a member, you know, there's a job application that they fill out and, and they'll probably meet Kwan or if Joseph happens to be there, they'll meet him or myself. So that's the easiest way. Joseph, your closing remarks. What, what do you want people to know about you or any advice that you have? What would you like to share? Um, that you have to make sure that you have a foundation. Um, my foundation is rooted in, in my relationship with God um, and who God is. Uh, and that governs me. You know, it's something that goes beyond what uh, the penal system, the state or country structure is, what they say is acceptable or is good or bad or right or wrong. Um, you have to have something that that anchors you and governs you. Um, and if you have that, um, then you will see people along the way um, that are able to help you um, get to a place that's uh, healthy. Um, and in that healthy place, you can be a blessing to everyone around you. Um, and so um, that's what's been happening in my life. That's what I'm a part of. And I'm thankful, I'm grateful. Uh, to be in this place, um, to have the experiences that I've had, um, because now I can help people uniquely. Um, as Andre talked about, um, certain people won't listen to you unless they can relate to your struggles. So uh, I'm blessed to be in a position I can to offer uh, advice uh, and help and wisdom uh, in some areas. Um, and uh, stay tuned. I'll let you know when I start my own business. <laughs> I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Kawan, what are your closing remarks? So when I was incarcerated, I read this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in it, it said that um poor people think in terms of I can't afford it, whereas rich people think in terms of how can I afford it? Understanding that simple concept and applying it to different aspects of your life is a window mentality. <laughs> I know when I was back in my madness, I made a lot of excuses why I wasn't doing this or why I wasn't accomplishing that. And I noticed that a lot of people who get out of prison, they also make a lot of excuses. Oh, they're not trying to hire me or this and that. We have to develop the mentality of a zero bullshit. We have to make no excuses for ourselves. And we have to develop that the mentality that was mentioned in the book. How can I afford it? What steps I'm going to take to accomplish the goals that I want to accomplish? And by me having that mind state and applying it while I'm out here, I have accomplished more in a year and a half than I've been out than people have who, who I left out, <laughs> out here 14 years ago. And this is just the beginning. And it's because of this mentality that I have that I'm not gonna make any excuses for myself. I'm not gonna have a pity party with, with, uh, with myself. I'm not gonna complain. I'm gonna be grateful. And I'm always gonna find a way to accomplish the goals and to get the things that I want out of life. And that mentality alone is a winner mentality. And I guarantee it, uh, if anyone takes on that mentality, they will be successful, especially for the fellows who are coming out, the men and women who are coming out of incarceration. We can't make excuses for ourselves. We can't, we live our whole lives making excuses for ourselves. And we have to have the winner mentality that I'm gonna accomplish my goals no matter what, no matter what obstacles are in my way, no matter what life throws at me, I'm gonna be successful no matter what. And you have to believe that. And you have to continue to have this conversation in your mind every day because that conversation is gonna get you to where you, where you wanna be at in life. And I'm living proof. <laughs> I'm living yes. proof of it. If, if, I, if I can do it, a guy who came to prison who didn't know how to read, who taught himself how to read, not only in his native language, which is English, but also in another language. If I can do it, anyone can do it. So there's no excuses. Don't make excuses for yourself. Just always find a way. There's always a loophole. There's always a way. There's always a will. There's a, we can accomplish anything we set our minds to. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kwan. Andre, first of all, tell us how we can get in contact with the outside plug. Um, and then your closing remarks, please. Okay, my website is theoutsideplug.com. 
and um you know it has the um business line and you know you can go to the menu um i would encourage people to look at uh you know the menu and look at the um blogs and my comments um it's not just for people that have been in inside you know um i speak on you know relevant issues out here that affect all of us and i welcome comments i'm very transparent and i'm i'm steadily evolving and learning we all are so that's how you bridge the gap between the OFs now, the ones that's out here, and the people that are just professionals or everyday citizens. They don't know. They don't know unless we explain our thoughts, what we've been through, what we're trying to accomplish. So you have to bridge that gap. Otherwise, it's like almost not their fault, so to speak. So, you know, um, I just welcome people to share their thoughts with me and, um, you know, help me evolve and I can help them evolve and we can bridge this gap and, you know, start really, you know, making the difference. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We are a few minutes over, but this has been such um, an enriching conversation. You know, one of the, the pillars of Moms of Black Boys United is changing perception. And if you guys are not the poster child for changing <laughs> perception, I don't know what it is. I have thoroughly enjoyed meeting you, conversing with you, and I appreciate you guys being transparent and sharing your stories. Um, if you guys have any additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm sure that the gentleman will uh, be happy to answer your questions. I will drop the websites in the comments as well. And as always, thank you for joining us. You guys have a wonderful day. You too. You too. Thank Take you. care. Take it easy. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye.